All right, welcome back. Um, I am Alexander Nemirov. I'm delighted to be giving the second of these Mellon lectures on the forest, America in the 1830s. And you'll recall what these lectures are about is the relation of art and life, and really how life gets into art, or what might it look like if it did, and, uh, and how does this relate to the forest? And even beyond that, what is a historian to do with something so mercurial or quicksilver as the relation of art and life? Who names what that is? Who identifies it? Who feels it? How can it be recovered or glimpsed even across um, many passages of time? So my focus today is John Quidor, the artist who lived most of his life in New York City, he was born in 1801, he died in 1881. He painted off and on his whole career. He made a number of paintings in the 1830s. Um, a strange figure who was also a sign painter, also painted paintings on fire engine backs, but also made something that was called art or like fine art then, and he is my focus. And the Subtitle of my talk, The Appearance of John Quidor's Art. Let's get right to that appearance and just note how odd it is. So this is a painting by John Quidor from 1832, so when he was 31 years old. It's uh, called The Money Diggers, and it's uh, at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. It's very small, and when you see it in person, it's only 15 by 20 inches and it depicts a scene from Washington Irving, from Irving's book called Tales of a Traveler, which was published in 1824, and has one kind of cautionary comic tale about a, a man who raises cabbages there on Lower Manhattan, Wolfert Weber, who dreams of making it rich, and hears stories at the local tavern of different buried treasures or a buried treasure, possibly buried there by pirates, and sets out to the secluded spot in near Corlears Hook in Lower Manhattan. The story is set in the early 18th century in company with a trusted confidant, the German Dr. Nipperhausen, uh, who comes with a divining rod and a basket of herbs and drugs to create a kind of brimstone smell that will supposedly keep the spirits of the dead buccaneers away from the um, looters of their treasure. Uh, a fire is lit as well per, per Dr. Nipperhausen's specifications. Meanwhile, a toad looks on from the brink of the pit from which Sam, the black fisherman with his pickaxe, is uh, climbing. And why is Sam climbing out? Well, you can see that things haven't gone according to plan for Wolfert Weber in his Golden Dreams because the pirate, sure enough, appears, who is probably not re a real ghost, but is rather this blowhard from the local tavern who is always regaling people ad infinitum with stories of uh, his buccaneer exploits, who has somehow got wind of Wolfert's Golden Dreams and is shaking his fist from the top of this pulpit-like rock. The real art and life, how am I possibly going to relate Quidor's picture into that. And let me just come back to this idea of the forest, the tree, that anthropomorphically rhymes with Wolfert's affrighted gesture. Um, another tree back um, behind um, Dr. Nipperhausen's knock-kneed fear. Uh, this is all, um, gives you a sense of the forested setting of, um, of this occult, almost demonic seeming ritual. The forest is a place where something real might happen. My mentor at, at, at Yale, Brian Wolf, called this painting a meditation on the unconscious or the meditation on, on excavated depths that we in our waking lives keep at bay. The forest is a place of uh, dark revelations where you know, what is hidden by day in our civilized guise is uh, blown forth and revealed in this radiation of wood smoke as um, the true emotions that we feel, in this case, um, um, lust, um, greed, etc. And then also, of course, guilt with 
uh, kind of personification of the superego here, uh, shaking his fist at Wolfert to say, uh, don't do it. The forest is a space of the real in the 1830s. I want to link this painting to two other uh, kind of rhymed or connected uh, scenes, both literary, though, that I think uh, do make a combination with Quidor's picture. They're both about the forest. One concerns a story from the English traveler in America, Francis Trollope, who uh, in the late 1820s in the Ohio country witnessed what was called a camp meeting. Uh, so a forest setting where people, Methodists, are going to pray, and she's a proper English lady, but she's trying to take in, as the title of her book uh, says, the domestic manners of the Americans, so what are the Americans like? And she says that we reach the ground, that is the camp meeting ground, about an hour before midnight. The spot chosen was the verge of an unbroken forest. Four high frames constructed in the form of altars were placed at the four corners of the enclosure, the setting where this um, prayer meeting will take place, and on these were supported layers of earth and sod on which burned immense fires of blazing pine wood. And she continues, when we arrived, the preachers were silent, but we heard issuing from nearly every tent, all these people have ridden uh, horses and uh, they have the tents there up to this secluded spot, mingled sounds of praying, preaching, singing, and lamentation. The curtains in front of each tent were dropped, so uh, concealing, uh, and the faint light that gleamed through the white drapery, backed as it was by the dark forest, had a beautiful and mysterious effect. And had the sounds which vibrated around us been less discordant, harsh, and unnatural, I should have enjoyed it. So it's, uh, it's uh, just outside of Cincinnati in the late 1820s, the book is published in 32, there's a sense of a real revelation that can take place away from the, the gridded streets of the metropolis or the town and instead unfold in the fiery forest. Another example, also linked to this idea of the forest and the real in the 1830s, how could I not mention Nathaniel Hawthorne in this context? And some of you might, may know his story, sort of a chilling magical fable to this day called Young Goodman Brown, published in 1835, set in the Salem days of the 17th century in New England. Young Goodman Brown, a good man, newly married to his allegorically named wholesome, kind wife, Faith, uh, sets out into the forest and he meets up with this strange gentleman who's carrying this serpent, um, sort of serpentine um, staff and um, what he finds as he is led by this gentleman out into this space, which is not unlike the Corlears Hook um, secluded magical space in The Money Diggers, is this. At one extremity of an open space hemmed in by the dark wall of the forest arose a rock bearing some rude natural resemblance either to an altar or a pulpit, and surrounded by four blazing pines, their tops aflame, their stems untouched like candles at an evening meeting. The mass of foliage that had overgrown the summit of the rock was all on fire, blazing high into the night and fitfully illuminating the whole field. Each pendant twig and leafy festoon was in a blaze. It turns out it's a kind of occult, dark, demon-worshipping ritual that all the good citizens, including the elderly woman who has taught young Goodman Brown his catechism as a boy, are all there in this devil rite revealed in the forest. The pilgrims, the Puritans, the purified, revealed as sinners in their hearts of hearts. And as they sing, Hawthorne says this, evoking very much the relation between natural between language and trees, a kind of natural language and nature that I spoke of last week. And with the final peal of that dreadful anthem, there came a sound as if the roaring wind, the rushing streams, the howling beasts, and every other voice of the unconverted wilderness was mingling and according with the voice of guilty man in homage to the prince of all. The four blazing pines threw up a loftier flame. So, um, Young Goodman Brown, from his venture into the forest, never changes to his dying day. He's a, 
a, a sort of untrustworthy, cynical man from that point on because he cannot believe in goodness because the forest has been the place where in a natural language what is revealed is who people really are, which is lustful, um, scheming, um, in, in a word, demonic. So Quidor, Trollope, and Hawthorne all to go, to go together in this sense of presenting the forest as a space of the real. But there's something now, a further twist to the story, and it's this. Trollope goes as a tourist to the forest. Young Goodman Brown, you know, Hawthorne's mouthpiece goes as a pilgrim of a kind. Um, Quidor is neither one exactly. I would nominate him as a wanderer. And this brings me to another element of Quidor's connection between art and life. Um, on the screen is another Quidor painting called Tom Walker and the Devil. So cast of characters is few, Tom Walker, the Devil. Um, 1856, so outside this period, but Quidor really repeats the same kind of themes through his whole career. Drawn here again to Washington Irving, this is another story from Tales of a Traveler from 1824. And in this story, Tom Walker is really a, a, a miser, a skinflint, a jerk. Um, he lives in 1727 outside Boston. He's a crabbed, mean-spirited figure. He, find, he thinks to take a shortcut through the woods one day, always a bad idea. And what he finds is a kind of swamp with this black smothering mud and these half-submerged, dead, rotten, pine and hemlock logs that are kind of lurking in the swamp, almost like alligators. Um, and in this dampness, he sits down because he's a supremely unscared figure, and he sees this skull which comes from the victim of an old Indian war of the 17th century and being you know, indifferent to the fate of other people. Tom Walker basically, you know, doesn't regard the skull with awe at all. Whereupon the devil appears. In the guise, uh, it's described as kind of a black man, kind of an Indian, some spirit of the place. They make a pact, and Tom Walker eventually um, does the devil's work as a money lender, and, but beyond that is um, escorted first class to, to hell at, at the end of his, the story. Uh, what is interesting to me about this picture is, apart from Irving's story, is the depiction of wandering. And I do see this as a kind of figure for Quidor, whose personal appearance is very hard to specify. He's mysterious, but I think he had many alter egos in his paintings, and I would suggest that Tom Walker is one. Not, however, the Tom Walker of meanness as such in the Irving sense, but rather Tom Walker as an itinerant, a vagabond, a traveler, as in this painting. And he, Tom Walker, and through him, Quidor, I feel link up with uh, the whole idea of the itinerant figure in 1830s America, the wanderer, almost like literally festooned with the wilderness, appearing every now and then out of the woods, from down the mountain, walking almost in a timed rhythm through the village to perhaps peddled his wares. And often these figures, as Hawthorne's notebooks reveal them to be, are artists of a kind or one kind or another, the peripatetic vagabond artists. So for example, uh, here from one of Hawthorne's notebooks, 1838, is a good description of one such artist. Um, After supper, as the sun was setting, and this is out in western Massachusetts near Williamstown, a man passed by the door with a hand organ, connected with which was a row of figures, such as dancers pirouetting and turning, a lady playing on a piano, soldiers, all these keeping time to the lively or slow tunes of the organ. And the man had a pleasant but sly, dark face. He carried his whole establishment on his shoulder, it being fastened to a staff which he rested on the ground when he performed. A little crowd gathered about him uh, on the stoop, so as he performs, peeping over each other's heads with huge admiration, all declaring that it was the masterpiece of sights. Some few coppers did the man obtain, as well as much praise. He had come over the high, solitary mountain where for miles 
there could hardly be a soul to hear his music. So, you know, this is the artist, the wanderer, in touch with not only loneliness, but supreme solitude, who periodically emerges into these places where, in a burst of fellow feeling and community, he performs with his kind of ragged entourage that he carries on his back and makes his way forward with. So a very far cry from the notion of art as the artist, the studio, as separated from life. Quidor had such a studio, for sure. He worked in New York, yet his allegiances were with figures like this hand organ player, so I say. Here's another example, the Dutchman from Hawthorne's notebooks. Hawthorne was so good at these just glancing sublimely everyday descriptions. Entering the little unpainted bar room, this is again in western Massachusetts, we heard a voice in a strange outlandish accent explaining a diorama. So some itinerant artist has emerged this time not with a hand or organ but a diorama. It was an old man with a full gray bearded countenance and Mr. Leach, the proprietor, exclaimed, ah, here's the old Dutchman. Though, by the way, Hawthorne says he's a German, and travels the country with this diorama in a wagon. So they go up to the diorama. We look through the glass offices of his, orifices of his machine while he exhibited a succession of the very worst scratchings and daubings that can be imagined, worn out too, and full of cracks and wrinkles, besmeared with tobacco smoke and every otherwise dilapidated. There were views of cities and edifices in Europe and ruins and of Napoleon's battles and Nelson's sea fights, in the midst of which would be seen a gigantic brown hairy hand, the hand of destiny. So this is the Dutchman's own hand coming into the diorama in true teacher fashion, pointing to the principal points of the conflict while the old Dutchman exclaimed, explained. So, you know, the, the vagabond, the, the ragged figure, but not just artists were these itinerants. One has to imagine America in the 1830s as this shuttle or relay between pretty terrifyingly solitudinous spaces, wildernesses, mountaintops, etc., country roads between villages, say, 13 miles, miles apart, and then, and then these sudden bursts into uh, visibility and to fellow feeling, and others could be, could, could perform this role. So Hawthorne says, the third of my three examples of vagabonds from Hawthorne, a disagreeable figure, now another figure, waning from middle age, clad in a pair of toe uh, homespun pantaloons and very dirty shirt, barefoot, and with one of his feet maimed by an ax. Also an arm amputated two or three inches below the elbow. His beard of a week's growth, grim and grisly, with a general effect of black, altogether a filthy and disgusting object. Yet, he has the signs of having been a handsome man in his idea, like in his own conception. Good morning, gentlemen, said this wretch, and nobody answered him for a time. Yet the guy kept talking, kind of like Coleridge's ancient mariner, basically. And there was something of the gentleman and man of intellect, they began to see, in his deep degradation, fascinating combination. And a pleasure in intellectual pursuits, and an acuteness and trained judgment, which bespoke a mind once strong and cultivated. And then this guy says this most remarkable thing, which it's hard to improve upon unless, you know, you were to make his proclamation more gender inclusive, but my study is man, said he. You know, that's what presumably we all try to do. My study is life, you could say, said he. You know, it's the person who's outside the rarefied artsiness of art who somehow is acquainted with um, what Robert Frost would, co the, would say is the miles and miles to go before he sleeps that can actually lock into something in the de decrepitude of his diorama or his hand organ or his own experience in person, some vision of life. I think Quidor had that sense of per the peripatetic and the, the solitudinous in his makeup when not coincidentally that gave him a chance to make contact with life. So Quidor was not a gentleman is what I'm trying to say. And on the screen is not John Quidor's hat because John Quidor was not a gentleman. It is Thomas Cole's hat. 
which I think you'll be pleased to know still exists uh, at Cedar Grove, Thomas Cole's house in Catskill, New York. A very delicate object made of felt and cardboard that on the in inside still bears the maker's, uh, the store's inscription, Watkins, 128 Fulton Street, the Sun Building. It's really, in a way, the most mesmerizing object you can see at Cedar Grove, including Cole's paintings, which, as you know from last week, I love. But there it is, and what it says, its hat box still survives, too, and it tells you like it was very important for Cole to keep this hat tip-top, is, you know, Cole saying, I'm a gentleman, you know, don't forget it. I may be an artist. Some of my Federalist patrons uh, may ask me to sit basically at the children's table at dinner when I'm at their grand estates making paintings, but I am a gentleman. Being an artist is being a gentleman. And the idea of the arts and being a gentleman is in the air and is au courant in 1830s Northeast. And there's a painting which is at the Princeton University Art Museum, which I feel, though it's little known and should be better known, I think embodies beautifully this idea of the artist, really artists as gentle men. And what is it? It's a painting by an artist named Robert Walter Weir. Um, and it is called the Greenwich Boat Club. Uh, it's quite small, 23 by 32 inches. It was painted in the year 1833 in Manhattan. And uh, it, sh it shows the members of the club named uh, not after Greenwich, Connecticut, but you know what we would call Greenwich Village now, who have on an outing in August of 1832 have sailed to the Jersey Shore. It is an arts community, what we're seeing here. This is an American Academy kind of painting, a distinguished group of arts and letters, and though the identities of the figures are not ascertainable with 100% certainty, it is possible that that is Weir, the artist himself. It is possible that this is a guy named James Elworth Decay, who was a zoologist and who went on to publish a book called The Zoology of New York in 1842 to 44. This person here might be a poet named uh, Fitzgreen Halleck, who wrote a poem about the Indian chief Red Jacket. Uh, this is a, a man named uh, Meggs, Henry Meggs, with this flute. Um, this possibly is uh, a novice painter, a kind of student of Weir's named Walter Oddie, O-D-D-I-E, though this figure reclining and reading could also be Oddie. It is, in a way, it speaks this group of Knickerbockers, you know, this cultural elite. This painting speaks to um, their wish to create a colony apart, their wish to create under, as it were, a small tent, um, a notion of uh, art as a part, art as existing separated on a figurative Jersey shore of the 1830s, away from the hustle and bustle of the commercial metropolis, devoted to lighter and tenderer, more soulful things. The guitarist, whose name has come down to us only by his last name, Martinez. His guitar um, you know, strokes have to be understood with the lapping of the water you know, as part of this natural language I've spoken about. Art apart, an exclusive academy, a kind of pantheon, um, that is well provided for the eggs, the shrimp um, cooking on the oak kind of barbecue here, some nice wine, they won't be thirsty. Uh, and it all has to do not only with uh, creating a colony apart, but also with escape. And there might be a literal escape. Was there a cholera epidemic in New York in the summer of 1832? Yes, there was. It came. Uh, first to North America in, uh, in Quebec, and then soon, within two weeks, was down in Manhattan. Several of these figures were actively involved in the, um, to attempt to avert the worst effects of the cholera epidemic in New York um, by virtue of what they knew about sanitation, et cetera. In any case, it's not just escaping disease, plague, that these figures um, uh, make their retreat in the name of. It is also, I think, to, uh, you know, it has the feeling of an artistic exodus. So you might just, you know, do a tally here and say, insofar as we're to understand what art in America is about, judging by this beautiful little painting, you'd say it's about 
separateness, exclusiveness, uh, a kind of tender community of privileged men, including possib possibly younger men. These two figures are likely the younger brothers of Adi, who is one of those, or of Megs, I'm sorry, the flute player. Um, so, you know, against this, you know, you have to be thinking of Quidor's qu vagabondage, and there's another way that this Quidor is distinguished from this kind of notion of art apart, and it is that, um, you know, these guys are so stationary. It's almost, this reminds me a bit of Neil Armstrong and the moon, you know, like planting a flag. There's the red flag here, but in any case, some sort of, if you like, not just colony, but colonization, not of New Jersey as such, but rather of um, place, land, like this is where we stand, this is our place. Whereas, as we already know, Quidor is so much on the move, and it's not just him and the figures he identifies with, but really his figures in his paintings, you know, the appearance of John Quidor's art, again, like they're, it's such a kind of crazy vibration to his paintings. It's as though someone put a coin in like the upper left, like there's a drop slot and everyone shakes, at least until the painting perceives you to be walking away and then it stops. But in this painting, for example, you know, which speaks to Quidor's uh, interest in agitation, vibration, the quiver of life, let's call it, it comes not from Irving, but from James Fenimore Cooper and from uh, the Leatherstocking Tales, and in particular the first one, which is called The Pioneers uh, from 1823. So the, the five Leatherstocking novels, in the, in the first one, Natty Bumpo, Leatherstocking, is, is the oldest. He's in his 70s. He's in retirement, basically. And the, the last one, The Deerslayer, in 1841, he's in his 20s. So he, go, he gets younger as the books go on, which is, as D.H. Lawrence said, so apt and beautiful. But in this story, you know, in a way it is about staking claim and colonization and Quidor's aversion to that. What is the story? Well, the, the kind of nefarious emissary of the local capitalist landowner named Marmaduke Temple, uh, this sheriff named Hiram Doolittle has come to serve our hero Leatherstocking with an arrest warrant because Leatherstocking has taken a deer out of season, killed a deer out of season, kind of like Robin Hood. And he's come with his uh, deputy, um, Jotham Riddle here, and then a kind of mercenary named Billy Kirby. Anyway, Leatherstocking is having none of it. He's basically saying, you people are hounding me to the, the you know ever more remote locations, leave me alone, he throws Doolittle down the, the precipice here, back to the shores of Lake Otsego. Uh, Kirby, or I'm sorry, Jotham Riddle flees as well. Kirby, who's kind of in league with the man he was meant to arrest, help arrest, just has a belly laugh. Um, what's interesting about this beyond just the story of um, you know, you know, there is no property, there is no location, I am on the move, I have a temporary habitation, leave me outside your writs and documents and rules. Let not just my art, but my person be a thing that is not codified and named and given uh, a value exactly, even as Quidor himself in his real life was a land speculator on farms in Illinois, for example, as a recent lovely article by the art historian Ross Barrett has taught me. The painting is another story, and you know, so there's this story of property and you know, staying, in a way, property-less. But more importantly is what I called your attention to at the start, which is just the agitation here. You know, the very, uh, the, dead, the dead trees are themselves saying to Jotham Riddle, be gone. The clouds are scudding to say, you know, leave this place. Um, Every brushstroke seem, every little splatter of paint, for example, you know, the writ itself seems to kind of palpitate with, as though it hasn't quite finally kind of come to rest. Uh, you know what life is in this picture? It's caught on the wing. It is um, still in process. It has not had a chance, like the fabled dioramas in the museum, to kind of assume its frozen state, waiting for us to leave so the caveman or the gazelle or whatever it is can go about its life. So there's a kind of magical 
quality to Quidor's pictures, and this is the way I put it to myself, the world unaccustomed to and even downright surprised to find itself in a painting of all places, right? How did I get in a painting? I'm the world, I'm life. I'm the ble breeze fluttering through the trees. I'm the bird skittering through the sky. How did I find myself trapped within this frame? It shakes and shimmies as if to extricate itself from this unwelcome predicament, but all to no avail, for it becomes stuck there. It can never get out, like the eel in the eel trap, let's say. Stuck, however, in the attitude of having been severed from life, still surprised, still alive, like Medusa's head after being cut off. So, you know, this is not something that obviously one aspires to do in literal, actual terms, but one can imagine it as one's fantasy as an artist. I will capture life on the wing, and then I will portray it as though its flutter, at fluttery agitation represents even its desire to escape from the world I've been I find myself, I, the world, find myself trapped in. Sounds far-fetched, but you know what? In a way, it's not at all, because many, many artists, you ask them what makes a work successful for them, they'll say it has the feeling of life. You know, um, Francis Bacon's a great example. Uh, I want to trap life in my paintings. Um, I know in another register, Agnes Martin, absolutely. If there's just an ounce of life in the painting, she says, then it can, it can live its own life, it can be on its own, it doesn't need me anymore. So it's, it's not just a trope, it, I tend to actually believe it rather more mystically that this is what moves us about works of art, and I'm saying Quidor's pictures in their own way have the agitation and sparkle and strange, almost unkempt vividness of life itself. They are not art, they are art life, or life art, something where it's impossibly the two have been combined. There is a further aspect to this, which brings me to this painting, obviously not by Quidor, but by William Sidney Mount, um, which is here at the National Gallery and is called The Tough Story, Seen in a Country Tavern from 1837. Mount, you may remember from last week, is the Long Island painter who picked, made the picture called After Dinner of the Violinist. Now, Mount's picture, the tough story it's called, illustrates how the story for Quidor, for Mount, for other artists then and there is the intermediary somehow between life and art. I need to introduce therefore this third term. It's not just life and art, but there's the story that is somehow circulating, like is the fuel pump between the underground tank and the car. It is the thing, it's the conduit that somehow connects the things, we've all heard a lively story, we've all heard a deadly story. Uh, this is a deadly story by Mount's own description. He said he wanted to depict something where one of a kind of, you know, country tavern haunter, this man here, is really not letting people go with his story. And, you know, you have to imagine him saying, and another thing, and, um, Every detail in this picture, Mount being so studied and scrupulous in how he was gonna show these pictures, and please do go see this painting after I finish talking today, uh, confirms this. Uh, I suspected the story has something to do with his tourniquet here, as well as the bandage here and the cane, basically how I got this injury. Um, the tourniquet with its little burst is to me the very picture of embellishment, you know, the expansion of the story emerging almost like a kind of diagram out of the guy's head. His glass is full. Uh, this mug here has, is the handle is pointed towards him, so that's probably his as well. Um, he's got cards falling out of his hat as if um, there's some kind of deal going on here. There's some kind of concealment, something else going on here, but he does have a willing listener. And this is really like the hero of the story who's going to just gut it out, I think, if I can paraphrase Mount's description, where you know we're down to pretty much the last log. They've both been keeping the fire going, he with the pan and here with the tongs. Uh, the fire is getting low. Um, you know, um, the, the warmth of the speaker seems unabated, especially whiskey infused, but nonetheless, even as they're divided by the stovepipe, and even, even as 
Even as they're divided by the stovepipe, they're rhymed. A speaker needing a listener. Uh, it reminds me of Emerson's phrase from 1844, in this our talking America, we are ruined by listening on all sides. The third figure is of equal importance. He is saying, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, I'm going to turn away. I've got my traveling cloak, my duster on. Um, he also has this appearance of being somewhat of an alter ego figure to the, the heroic listener here, um, as if to say, to embody almost thought balloon style, his own thoughts of wishing to leave but being more or less pinned there. There's nonetheless a, an avidity to this figure here, um, even though the door is truly blocked by the man who is commanding the room with his story. So um, what this gets at in terms of storytelling as the conduit between art and life is just this, that um, a deadened story somehow makes things stationary, whereas a lively story, and I think Quido was so good at this, is able to capture things on the wing, is able, to, every incident is able to, is, has a kind of flutter of life about it, and its brevity and impermanence as it skitters along on the track of the story, the groove of the story is part of the charm of it. Something said once briefly yet haunts the mind, something elaborated ad infinitum by the scholar of his own life uh, cannot be forgotten soon enough. Is it not so? So, um, you know, this is a risk that paintings run. I think this is the, s the second level of Mount's picture that, you know, when when pictures themselves decide to take on stories, that can be a tough bargain as well because they lock themselves into a kind of stationary atmosphere of the unfolding, the unfolding, the unfolding tale, which has a kind of locked and frozen quality which is so distinct from Quidor's sense of my storytelling will be on the fly. There is a second difference between storytelling of Quidor's kind and Mount's, and it involves invoking a figure we heard from last week, who's a very exemplary figure for this time and place, uh, and that's Tocqueville, who's going to be talking about Americans' fixation on their own lives and their own stories and the effects of that on their discourse. So Tocqueville, in volume two of Democracy in America, says, I've often noticed that the Americans whose language when talking business is clear and dry without the slightest ornament and of, and of such extreme simplicity as often to be vulgar, easily turn bombastic when they attempt a poetic style. Interesting, so why is that? Well, he says the reason is easily pointed out. Each citizen of a democracy generally spends his time considering the interests of a very insignificant person, namely himself. If he ever does raise his eyes higher, and this is the disorientation, he sees nothing but the huge apparition of society or the even larger form of the human race. So he has nothing but between, nothing between very limited and clear ideas about who he is and what his concerns are, and very general and very vague conceptions. The space between is empty. So that translates rhetorically. When he is drawn out of himself, he always expects, you know, waking up from his absorption, self-absorption, to have some prodigious subject put before him, and that is the only consideration, which would induce him for one moment to tear himself away from the complicated little cares that are the excitement and joy of his life. So this figure is not a public speaker, but is obviously completely within the closed door, the locked room of his own liquor-infused, complicated little cares that are the excitement and joy of his life. Tocqueville goes on, this appears to me to explain sufficiently why democratic citizens whose concerns in general are so paltry call on their poets for such vast conceptions and descriptions out of proportion. These poets achieve giganticism, missing real grandeur. They just kind of are blowhards and then the real grandeur, you might think of Lincoln, for example, as someone who can actually evoke a not-self, an unself, i.e. a nation, life that is grand instead of just gigantic. Very hard to do. So 
these poets might also be guilty of giganticism. Let's look at Quidor and his storytelling and his self-absorption in connection with Mount Year and allow us to address maybe even for once and for all the charge or the idea that a romantic poet or painter is the most narcissistic person of all. It's because they are not, as Quidor is here in a very early, almost juvenile self-portrait that is at the Newark Art Museum from 1822-23, so like when he was 21 years old, uh, seems to be. You know, he's, he's isolated, these figures, whatever the, the kind of um, drudgery of the discourse, are part of a community. They're part of what we call democracy. They're part of life, um, you know, in a more, let's say, other-oriented or community-oriented way than, than this figure. Yet the opposite is actually the case. And this gets to the idea of the exclusive power or special power of the romantic poet or painter. And how so? Well, and, and the very unegotistical power of him or her as a storyteller. You'll notice in this picture, Quidor has his box of paints, he has his canvas, he sits beneath a brook or next to a brook beneath a tree that anthropomorphically extends out in his line of vision as his eyes look off to some unseen things that he paints. There are only two things that are in this picture that don't concern the artist. One is what he paints. Notice, whatever it is, it's not himself, though it is informed by himself. It's informed by the kind of branch of his, the flowering, leafing branch of his uh, electrified vision. That and also the source from which he paints, because if his canvas and his box of paints kind of are almost part of the root system of this tree under which he paints, this tree represents, as it were, a kind of natural source that he draws from, almost literally, to come up with whatever inspiration it is that allows him to paint the world that is not him. The romantic artists say, in, as in the idea of the Aeolian harp, something like that, is the person who portrays what is not himself through the medium of himself, drawing on what is not himself in order to portray this what is not himself. It is, you know, superficially the, ult the ultimate kind of s um, solitary or narcissistic storytelling. In fact, as Emerson would say fully, it is about, um, it's a fundamentally generous act in which you give to others what they could not name or describe in the midst of their shuttling back and forth between uh, kind of horrifying self-absorption on the one hand and grand, unconvincing bombast on the other, what they cannot give themselves. Uh, what the artist gives is something that is the not-self for every one of us. A way to think of this with all of these things with Quidor is to group them all under the word episode, which I admit is a harmless sounding word, yet I think has immense currency with respect to this ethical question of the relation of art and life I'm speaking about today. How is this so? Well, here's another quivering, very strange painting by Quidor from 1832, it's actually a pendant to the earlier picture called Leather Stocking Meets the Law. It's the same size, 26 by 34 inches. It's at the Met. It's called Leather Stocking's Rescue. It's also from that book, The Pioneers, where Leather Stocking, in his 70s, um, and beset upon by the avaricious grandee Marmaduke Temple, nonetheless saves Marmaduke Temple's daughter here, um, along with her friend, Louisa Grant, uh, from the attack of a wild panther shown in extremely odd fashion by <laughs> Quidor, who you'll recall was a sign painter and whose um, animals especially evoke his sign painting work, which none, no examples of which survive, but was, was really his more prevalent activity. Uh, there's another creature you will see down here who seems to be sleeping but is actually dead, and that is 
the dog of Marmaduke Temple's daughter, the dog named Brave, who by this point, having been raised as a pup, is now from a pup, is now an elderly dog, but who has loyally uh, been, um, you know, barking at a little lion, mountain lion cub, who turns out, unfortunately, to be the cub of this mountain lion here. Bar Brave, the dog, kills the cub. The the panther kills Brave, and then the panther looks at the next victims, whereupon, in glorious melodramatic fashion, Leatherstocking appears out of nowhere, and basically, in this kind of inimitable Cooperian dialogue, says, Miss, would you mind just moving your head a little to the left? Your bonnet, your bonnet is in the way, uh, and there's some equivocation in the story about whether uh, the daughter just doesn't just drop her head, resigned fashion, willing to succumb to her fate before the panther, and that fortuitously allows Leatherstocking his clear shot. You'll notice I'm not quoting from Cooper in text printed on the screen. I'm penalizing him for overusing the word sapling. Um, but in any case, this shot allows the death of Brave to be avenged, and um, this is the picture. Episode is the word I mentioned. It is an episode. We could just say, well, it's an episode from Cooper, but I think episode encompasses something that is um, impermanent, that is brief, and to contrast an episode with what it is very vaingloriously not, uh, I want to show you what I think is a source for this picture, and it is um, this painting, which is at the Yale Center for British Art by the 18th century, the neoclassical British landscape painter Richard Wilson, called uh, the, death of the, the Death of the Daughters and Sons of Niobe, N-I-O-B-E, who has made the mistake of offending the gods by refusing to sacrifice in their honor, and moreover by flouting the exquisite qualities of her seven sons and seven daughters, whereupon Apollo uh, kills all 14 of them in one shower of arrows, the deaths of many of them described with exquisitely gruesome specificity by Ovid the poet. You'll see that there is this figure up here, there's a reclining figure, there are blasted trees, etc. cetera. Um, you know, this comparison makes clear, I think, though the Wilson is somewhat murky, that, um, you know, Quidor is taking from, not just from Wilson, but from Ovid, and kind of giving it this rustic vernacular quality. It would almost be as though the, the Dutchman with the hairy hand, or the man with the amputated arm or the organ, hand organ person were to tell the story of Niobe in frontier western Massachusetts. It's sort of rustified and made more vivid and quivering accordingly, and not incidentally the, the kind of um, pomp and splendor of the neoclassical painting is mocked. You know, here's another way to put it if you look at the engraving by Samuel Smith from Wilson's painting, which makes the protagonists of that painting much clearer. You can see, for example, the trees here, uh, the different victims, some yet to succumb, some already having fallen. You know, this is the way I would put it. There are no episodes in Ovid. You know, I, I don't, I've never heard anyone say, well, in this episode, Atalanta and Hippomenes are devoured by wild lions after making love in a sacred grotto. You know, no one says that, I don't think. Uh, episode doesn't really seem right. It's rather like the Wilson painting or the engraving after it. You know, uh, myth has this kind of beautiful, frozen, perpetuity to it, a kind of straining after immortality of the marbly kind, and in fact, Niobe, grief-stricken with the deaths of her 14 children, turns into marble down which water, a kind of tear-like water, perpetually flows. Episode is then the very equivalent of like Natty's uh, homespun uh, clothing, you know, it is something that is, um, unpretentious and 
still is, as it were, a kind of mixing box between life and what is not life, and I would say that's called art in the highest sense. This word episode connects very much to Quidor's own life in a way I can now portray for you with respect to this painting on the screen, which is the great Quidor here at the National Gallery, and you must see it uh, soon. It's the return of Rip Van Winkle, and it was painted in 1849, so later, but Quidor, as we know, was really preoccupied with stories from Washington Irving. Here, the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon contains the story of Rip Van Winkle from 1819-20, so it's a kind of constant theme for Quidor. What is happening here, You, many of you will recognize the story that Rip, after having gone into the Catskill Mountains here to escape his scolding wife, uh, has been hunting, whereupon he meets with the most mysterious group of oddly dressed Dutchmen who are engaged in this game of bowling in the mountains and drinking heavily up there, whereupon Rip t takes one little sip tentatively at first, then expands his uh, consumption and eventually falls asleep. When he wakes up, he thinks it's the next morning, but it's 20 years later. His uh, gun is ruined. He's become an old man with long white beard. He's returning to his town now to um, discover that nothing is as he thought it was. This is his son, the spitting image of Rip's younger self in his kind of lassitudinous do-nothing way. Uh, the little urchins here mock this strange, unkempt stranger. The populace here also uh, has a good laugh at his expense. Meanwhile, the law or authority or government, whatever it is, standing on the other side from the mob uh, also looks on with suspicion at this odd newcomer, this stranger, this vagabond, this weirdo who seems resurrected. There's something very kind of uh, corpse-like about the you know, the missing uh, fabric around the knees and these kind of almost sandal-like remnants of his boots revealing the toes, etc. cetera. Um, it's the artist in America, in a way. I feel this picture to be. Like, the artist is someone who has Congress with the mountaintops, who goes to places, higher places, that the horizontal world doesn't need or disdains. And then when he emerges kind of hoary with the frost of 20 winters to share what is truly an unbelievable yet truthful experience, uh, he's met with only two groups of disdain. One is on the part of the people at large. One is on the part of government or the law. Certainly true to this day, both groups fail to understand the artist in his or her otherness. Even the artist himself is disoriented. He can't understand his otherness. Uh, the person that we see at a, at a gallery opening and someone whispers, that's the artist, and it's a person drinking white wine out of a plastic cup, it's somewhat kind of um, anticlimactic to say, oh, that's the artist. The artist in the true sense is the artist who deals with other places, the artist inside his or her work, who is in the 20 years sleep of their work. Let us not forget, I don't, I don't see that anything has changed from the romantic's conception of what an artist is and what an artist, a real artist is now. So this is the nightmarish story and you know descriptions of Quidor's life such that they are give us a little bit of a sense of him identifying with this episode, this moment in the life, not just of Rip, but of an artist. A former student of Quidor's many years later would say he, Quidor, would absent himself from his studio for days and weeks together, so not a great teacher. <laughs> when present, if not painting a banner or a fire engine back, he would generally lie at full length on the long bench that also served him for a couch when he felt indisposed to go home. So it's, it's almost like this Dracula-like feeling of like when he's not making a painting, he's just lying on this bench in this quiescent state. Uh, the same uh, student, Thomas Banks Thorpe, says, Quidor's rooms were without adornment of any kind. This is like on Spring Street in 
lower Manhattan, a coat of primitive dust lay undisturbed on the window sills and the mantelpieces. You feel it's like covering Quidor too. And the floor was checkered and dirt, dirty. A long bench and two or three dilapidated chairs composed the furniture of the room. And oh yes, there was an easel next to the north window, that, that key thing. So, uh, you know, this is a, one of Quidor's alter egos, the artist in his supreme price of making contact with that unbelievable thing we call life uh, is met with derision and scorn for his very fathoming of that same rare and beautiful thing. There's someone else who connects to Quidor in this way, and it's maybe the greatest episodic writer, life writer of all time, and we can see that through a painting by Quidor that seems to have nothing to do with our story of Rip here. This is another one of these very early paintings by Quidor, made when he was about 21, and which you can see at the Brooklyn Art Museum where the money diggers are, is, and it's called Dorothea. And it, is a, it shows a story from Don Quixote. Uh, and, and it's even kind of cribbed directly out of a frontispiece of an 1820 translation of Cervantes' novel, which was published in two parts, 1605, in 1615, Dorothea is a virtuous young woman who's been beset upon by a total cad, and in order to, s to escape the dishonor of having been seduced by this guy named Don Cardinio, she sets off into the woods and disguises herself as a shepherd boy. This is her, these are her belongings in this satchel. Uh, in an unguarded moment, she's letting her hair down because she keeps it up to impersonate a boy, and she's revealed to Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, and their compatriots, and thereby tells her story. It's an episode in Don Quixote. And you know, when I think of Quidor, that you know, it's such a, maybe this is just circumstance, it's such an odd name, Quidor, Q-U-I, and then you know, here he is making this picture from Don Quixote, Q-U-I. It's not wrong to call Quidor quixotic. No one knows anything about him, really to this day beyond a few odds and ends. He is, you know, this is a kind of Don Quixote figure too, in other words. Maybe this is even a Sancho Panza figure. And this has extreme bearing on our notion of like the episodes of Quidor's life and art and their kind of quivering, still lasting, they haven't stopped vibrating to this day, sensation in his paintings. You know, if you look at Don Quixote, as exemplified, say, in some 18th century French prints out, uh, from some of the other episodes in that glorious novel, like the great story of the Helmet of Mambrino, where Don Quixote sees a, a, a barber just riding through the, you know, the flats of Seville, and um, he, the bar, it's raining, so the barber puts his basin, you know, his barber's basin on his head, and then Don Quixote says that, that's the hel helmet of Mambrino, you know, of like a glorious night, we must take it, and he eventually uh, gets it and becomes, this is now the whole print, uh, the figure of fun, just like Rip, even Sancho Panza is having a good laugh, something like these urchins here. You know, all Don Quixote was doing was trying to make life noble, try trying to refuse the idea that uh, life is, is just as despairing and plain and ugly and mean-spirited as it sometimes seems to be, and instead investing it with this supernatural faith in nobility, goodness, good deeds, epic quests. You could call it like meaning, having meaning in life. And for that, and this is of course Cervantes' brilliance, he is uh, mocked, he is scorned, uh, Don Quixote is a kind of artist, and he is, you know, flagellated and beaten and mocked in ways more severe than the mild uh, satire in this scene. Um, there's an episode in the second volume of Don Quixote from 1615, which has to do with uh, the Countess Trifaldi, and who is in Don Quixote, has read the first volume of Don Quixote and then knows about Don Quixote and therefore knows that he's a buffoon, a kind of fool, and tricks him and Sancho into mounting blindfolded this wooden horse, Clavelino, 
uh, that they tell them, the blindfolded dupes, that is actually riding through the heavens. And then they light firecrackers and so on to simulate the crash landing here. Harold Bloom, the great literary critic at Yale for many years, says something about you know, this second part of Don Quixote, which is, I, I agree with, which is that you know, people laugh at, at how funny it is, and you know, it is funny when the Countess Trafaldi tells Sancho you know, that he must beat himself on the buttocks with a whip 3,300 times if Lady Dulcinea will reappear to Don Quixote in her, in her beauteous original shape. Yet what Bloom says is, um, is it's not funny. You know, it's actually, it's very sadistic. And this is a great example of a, a kind of, as it were, a good humored but also sadistic ritual. This is a good example of, as it were, a good humored but sadistic ritual. Now I always think in a way that Quidor makes a good combination in this, precisely in this somewhat melancholy respect, not with Irving, who I don't think was a, a, a melancholy figure uh, per se, but with Hawthorne. And there's this note in the American Notebooks from 1835, Hawthorne says, the world is so sad and solemn that things meant in jest are liable by an overpowering influence to become dreadful earnest, gaily dressed fantasies turning to ghostly and black and clad images of themselves. So that, to me, rhymes with this almost. Gaily dressed fantasies turning to ghostly and black clad images of themselves. So this painting says so much about that um, for Quidor. This is the painting called The Headless Horseman by Quidor at the Yale University Art Gallery, painted very early in his career in 1828. And it shows Ichabod Crane uh, riding, you know, hell-bent for leather through the open plain, trying to, just this opening in the dark and deeply anthropomorphic forest trying to make the bridge that he feels will secure him safety, being pursued, not really visibly, but by Brom Bones, the local tough, basically like the, you know, the star athlete, if there were star athletes of the, um, in 17th century, um, or in, in early Terrytown, um, who simulates the headless horseman of legend and who then ultimately throws his pumpkin head at Ichabod Crane. Um, you know, it's funny in the Ichabod Crane in the Washington Irving way, but it is also a disturbing picture about human aloneness and about being beset by one's own fears and nightmare tribulations all along the isolate and unbelievable track of one's own personal voyage. It is, if you like, the nightmarish flip side to what Tocqueville spoke about in terms of the obsessions of the particular American. I suppose those obsessions come with their, their dark side, with the log lifted up and the ants and roaches and beetles scurrying beneath it. Um, so in one sense, you'd have to say right away that this is Quidor being in league with the notion of um, the traveler, the, um, not just the vagabond, but the, the fearful traveler now in a hostile world. But there is one other way that this is so, for me at least, and it is has to do with what I've said several times in this lecture, that Quidor was a sign painter. And I suppose of all the paintings he's made uh, that I've shown you today, this is the one that seems most sign painting-like for me, not literally, and it doesn't literally show a tavern sign like some of the other pictures I've shown you uh, can, for example, Rip Van Winkle, but, you know, the sign paintings that do survive from the 1830s, many of them at the Connecticut Historical Society actually, give you a sense of Quidor's major stock in trade. Now you can think back to that panther in Leatherstocking's Rescue.
And they make me think, at least, of how, how powerful a sign, a tavern sign is, as an emblem of life, because unlike a work of art, of course, like that is sequestered in a, in a gallery or in a parlor or something like this, these things would have literally flapped in the breezes and be, have been struck by many a day's sunshine and many a night's moonshine and would have been glimpsed by who knows what manner of people in all degrees of spirits, uh, relief, I think of most often. Um, I mean, so I think of a picture like this as embodying something about what it is to encounter a tavern and a tavern sign then. It would be the tavern to the traveler, you know, long journeys in a kind of wasteland of terrifying emptiness with only one's mind to keep one company. Punctuated by moments of respite where, you know, augured, said, proclaimed by the tavern sign itself, there is um, warmth, community, togetherness, kindness, some form of collegiality. American life, caught on the wing as punctuated almost like the dashes and dots of Morse code um, by essentially these two ur components of duration, 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 nothing happening, um, quiescence, traveling, sleep, scurrying, hurrying, then here, I'm here, the tavern to the traveler. But this picture em embodying both of those moods of the feeling of you know the, the tavern having arrived or having arrived at the tavern at the static sign, but also still bearing within oneself the traces, the sort of flow, the tatters and rags of one's journey across many miles of unconverted wilderness. This and last, this too. And this is most improbable, but I've been talking about Washington Irving and all kinds of improbable legends, and I suppose that word legend from last week comes back again. When I look at this painting, I think of it as not just evoking a tavern sign more broadly, but as referring even to, in imagination, the way light, let's say moonlight, could actually have been envisioned to strike such a tavern sign so that the moonlight hitting this tree, for example, or skating along the edge of these leaves or this branch or on the good steed gunpowder here, um, you know, is not meant just to represent light in the internal world of the painting, moonlight hitting Ichabod Crane, but light hitting the tavern sign itself. And I don't know about you, but I could just say that that's impossible. It's really not how paintings work. It savors more of my wish that it would be true rather than otherwise. But I think there's something in that wish that is of importance to us all, which is a philosophy of history. How does one recover moments of life as a historian looking back across several hundred years? How does one not relegate everything to just the over there, the apart from me, the, um, you know, the, the facts and figures of uh, once upon a time. And, you know, I think the past comes most alive for me in these glancing moments where an individual sensation bursts forth, whether in prose or in painting. And the philosophy of history is just this, that rather than epic histories, please don't give them to me, Rather than epic histories, grand stories of armies on the march, et cetera, I would prefer the single kind of glancing incident of moonlight on a tavern sign in some place as it was beheld by a wandering traveler with mixed trepidation and relief uh, to all those other stories, and therein constitutes my philosophy of history, of art, and also of life. Thank you. <laughs>